want you to stay out of the sacramental wine. He was having a hard time speaking there, wasn't he? We might have to start drug testing our staff. Oh, they bo- kind of heard a boo over here, Billy. <laughs> I'm starting to lose this one a little bit. It's good having you all this morning. Um, and it was so good having uh, both Jared and Mary Beth. Where, where are you at right now? I can't see. Are they still in here? Um, just real quickly, I don't know if you ever said, what's the name of your cult? <laughs> local church what? Local cult fellowship. Doc, no, localchurchfellowship.com. It's, it was, seriously, you guys, it's so good having you guys here. Love you guys so much. Um, well, we were, we're going to be opening up our Bibles this morning uh, to First Peter. That's where we're going to start. That's where we finished off. We're going to then launch into both Ephesians and into Matthew. Um, we're starting a series on membership. And before you now shut me off and go, oh, membership, I am very excited about this next series because I believe deep within all of us, we have a sense of wanting to belong, a sense of wanting to be a part of something, to know that we're not only a part of it, but we're a part of it from the standpoint that there are a group of people that are committed to me no matter what. And so that's where we're going to be going. But I'm going to start this way. Yesterday, I don't know how you all um, kind of worked through what happened on 9-11 20 years ago. For me, I just started to listen to some of the speeches. Um, one of the speeches that probably stuck out to me the most, and, and before anybody like sends me an email and says this was a terrible speech because of one line, what President Bush did yesterday, I really don't care about that. What I did hear, though, that I was so appreciative of is as he started to speak there was this side of it that I just missed the empathy of George Bush. You always felt like you were with him, like he was just one of the people with you. Not only was it empathetic in how he walked it through, but there was one section in there where he's talking about that plane that was flying over Pennsylvania that ended up crashing into a field. And all of a sudden, he started talking about these group of people that rushed the ones that were the terrorists to be able to deal with the plane, and obviously it crashed. But he just said this statement where he said, that's what Americans do. He gave us a sense of reminding us like who we are and what does it mean to be Amer- an American? What is it? And I, I felt there was another side of it that was so good, just this great mission that we're a part of that's worth it. He, he talked about it, and again, for those of us that were alive during this, we remember when when 9-11 happened, remember how we all kind of got along? It was incredible. You know, you're on the 405, and suddenly people are, like, slowing down and going, oh, yeah, come in. Go ahead. You know, it's all good. You know, you're waving each other on the 405 as everybody's going by like we live in some small town. And, but there was just this side of life that was so different. But again, the thing I think I appreciated about him so much was just he empathized. You, you were there somebody that was with him. Now, when you read the book of 1 Peter, I think this is what you have to keep in mind. You have Peter, this guy that was an older man by this time. He had lived a lot of life. And he's writing this letter to this group of churches up in northern Galatia. And when he writes this, this is the position he's writing from, is somebody that was in it with them. He was empathizing with them, helping them to understand. He understood what they were going exactly through. But what I love so much of what he did is he didn't kind of coddle them wrongly. He, you know, he didn't, oh, it's going to be okay. He didn't do that. He said, I understand what you're going through, but all of 1 Peter 1 through the middle of chapter 2 is just this large now statement of, but don't forget who you are. You're not just anybody. You are God's precious people, and even if you go through these difficult things, never, ever, ever forget who you are. And in writing to them in that particular moment and telling them who they were, he went on then, and he began to convey upon them this sense of mission, what we're involved in. Like on one level, I am so thankful that I'm an American. I'm a part of this great experiment that's that trying to work out this idea of a, of a democratic constitutional republic, and I don't get it all the time, and I don't know why everybody's arguing all the time. It is a wonderful thing to be a part of this, but there is nothing greater than being a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Nothing. And Peter looks at them all now, and he starts to talk to them about it. And in chapter 2, did I go too far? Here we go. All right, chapter 2, and verse 4, he then lays out for them. And if you've got your Bibles, you can look at this. And he, he just says this statement, as you come to him, to Christ, 
this living stone, this, this one that he's going to talk about in a little bit that has been rejected by people, but in the sight of God, he is chosen and precious. You yourselves also, like living stones, are being built up as this spiritual house to be this holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's saying to them, do you understand who you are? You are this group of people that though others may reject you, though others may shame you, verse 6, it stands in Scripture. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him, oh, you're not going to be put to shame at all. In fact, verse 7, honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. These groups of people out there, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Oops, I'm way behind because I'm not going. (laughs) Catch up verse 9 back there with me. There we go. But, and here's what I want you to see this. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's saying to them, do you get who you are? You're not just anybody. You're this group of people that God used to not show mercy to, but now he shows mercy to you. He is building all of you together in this powerful way to be this collective then transmission to the world of the greatness of Jesus Christ. You are this special people that out of of all the different peoples in the world, he's, he's chosen you to make you one of his very own. And not only that, but somehow in some way when he pulls us all together, go to the next slide, When he pulls us all together now, we're this group of people that become sober-minded. We become also, can you go back a slide? There we go. Sober-minded that are watchful, that are this group of people that have this adversary, this devil that prowls around, around looking whom he may devour. But you all are able to resist him. In this powerful way, this overcoming of evil forces in the world, you are that group of people. See, this is, we've been going through the book of 1 Peter. This is what I've wanted all of us to grapple with as we call ourselves these elect exiles, what Peter talks about. We are this people chosen by God, and we're part of the biggest thing ever. It gets no bigger than this. If you are sitting here today and you are in Christ Jesus, there is nothing bigger on the entire planet. Now here's though the the, the part that's kind of hard to wrap our minds around. If you were gonna launch the biggest thing ever in the world, what would you do? I mean, just think about that for a second. If I was gonna launch the biggest thing in the world, I'd make sure that, you know, I got Kim, and Kim gets me together Facebook, and she gets together Instagram, and she gets together uh, Twitter, and she gets together whatever else there is out there, Snapchat, and if you know of another one, don't say it right now, but it's just, I would start doing this huge social media plug, and we'd get out on the TV, and we'd do all these different things, but yet what's so fascinating about Peter is he doesn't call him to do that. Instead, when you, when you come to chapter 5, verse 1, look, at, look down there with me just a second. If you've got your Bibles open, how are, that are we supposed to do it? Are we supposed to get into these massive battle groups to begin to take on the world? Are we to begin to get into political parties to be able to change the political landscape? Are we to protest and picket and do all these other things? No. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to find this group of people called elders who are among you. As fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, and I want that group of shepherds, I want them to just shepherd the flock of God that's among you. I want them to exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but just willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain. I don't want you to fleece the, 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 the sheep and then take it and use it for your own thing, but instead I want you to do it eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but just being examples to the flock. In other words, 
I just want it to be this local, committed group of leaders, and I just want you to dive in the lives of people. He also talks about in verse five, likewise, I want you who are younger, and we, we talked about that, that's just kind of all the other ones that are a part of the local church that were following these elders. I just want you to be subject to the elders. I want you to clothe all of you, yourselves in humility towards one another, for God opposes the crowd but gives grace to the humble. How does Peter tell us to launch this great cosmic reality? Through local committed relationships to one another. That's how. Now that seems so strange, doesn't it? I just want you to make good friendships, good godly friendships inside of Jesus. I want you to have these leaders that model for you. That's how I want you to do it. But in the back of our minds, we're thinking, there's no way. We need to do big things for Jesus. But yet, all throughout the Bible, it's just these local, committed relationships. In fact, in 1 Peter, it talks about husbands and wives. It talks about work. It, it talks about these different facets of life. In other words, I just want you to get into those simple things and trust me as God of the entire universe that the working out of my mission just happens in simple, local, committed relationships. Now, we might say, okay, well, that's just Peter. Well, good. I'm glad you asked that question. Who else then? Well, Paul. Turn with me to Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, Paul does almost the, exactly the same thing. And in verses 3 through 14, man, if you haven't read it before, this is Paul. And he launches off into this amazing tale of who we are specifically in Christ. He constantly talks about the reality of what it means to be in Christ, who we are in Christ. But then when he comes to verse 15, this is what I want you to see. He's going to lay out for them now. Here's the big thing that we're going to be involved in. Look at verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I don't cease to give thanks for all of you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked out in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church who is the body, the fullness of him who fills all. All in all. In other words, this church being the very mechanism by which God is going to change the world. Now again, if you were going to launch the greatest thing in the world, what would you do? I think, again, I, would, I might do social media. I also might be the one that tries to get on TV. I'd try to get in the paper. I would try to announce things as loud as I possibly could to know what I was doing, but that's actually not what he's going to say. In fact, he even talks about it. Look down at chapter 3, verse 10. It's not only that he's going to bring this whole thing to bear, but through this church in chapter 3, verse 10, this group of people, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authority in heaven places. In other words, it's not just that people would see, but all the demonic realm might see that God's people are absolutely amazing. How would you announce it? What would you do? On well, chapter 4, go forward there, verse 10, what does he do? On well, verse 10, it just says, he who descended, that being Jesus, the one who took on flesh, took on humanity, was also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, Jesus, what are we supposed to do? Well, he just gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherd teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be these children that are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, 
or to just grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. When each part is working properly, what does it do? It makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What's the thing? Just local, committed relationships. The way this whole thing happens is in just that simple of a way. Like, in fact, if you go back to the time of Jesus and you look at his life, there wasn't all these mechanisms to announce this great movement. Jesus knew that the greatest way to advance what he was doing was not through all these things that have human wisdom involved in it, but instead through God's wisdom, through people that seemed so weak, through movements that seemed so much like the winds of the world were against them. And it's just through these relationships. In chapter five, he talks about married people and how husbands and wives are to get along together in a unique way in the Lord. Talks about parents and kids in the workplace, similar to what Peter was kind of talking about. It's just, it gets worked out in every facet of mundane life. I'll never forget one, one night I was, my, my wife and I, like many of you know, we, did, we do foster care. And one night I had this little baby in my hands and the baby wouldn't sleep and it was screaming and yelling and I kind of didn't know what to do. And I just remember thinking in the back of my head, oh, Father, I can't stand this kid's mom. How in the world could a mother ever do this to a child? And that moment, just feeling human suffering that was sitting in my hand. And I remember like it was clear as day, just the Lord impressing upon me in that moment. I didn't ask you to try to figure out what's going on in the world with all the suffering. I just asked you, Todd, tonight just to hold that little baby. Just hold it. I mean, every facet of my life in which God has done anything good did not come from big, grandiose things. Everything that has been good in my life has come from these intimate relationships with men like Pat McLeod and, and men like Blake Shaw and Richard Crocker and, and the myriad of other people that have invested themselves into my life. They're the people that just came alongside of me to help me to understand who I am in Jesus. And what is so crazy is out of those relationships, things have just begun to expand. It is just being in these local, committed relationships with one another. Now, in the back of your head, you might be saying, well, how are we supposed to do big things for God? I went over to Africa at one point, a guy named Pastor Julius, and I will be forever indebted to him in the role he played in my life. We were sitting around his house one night, and we were eating a meal together, and as we're eating together, all of a sudden he looks at me, and he says this statement, he goes, why do you keep taking our children? I kind of stopped, and I go, excuse me? He goes, will you keep talking to me about foster care and you bringing these children in so that you might demonstrate to the world how much you love kids? Why is it that you keep putting our kids in orphanages and then taking them away from us when you need to teach us as the church how to take those kids in our home so that we can show people who Jesus is? I didn't know we were. And we just sat down that day and I heard the heart of a man that said, no, the greatest way to solve the problem is not first maybe primarily at the front end, just, just to put a kid in. Now, I'm so thankful for all the orphanages are in that take kids in. But he said, you need to help us be the church here. You need to help us to be the local expression of the church in this place so that we might demonstrate to the world who Jesus is. Everything about God and what he is doing in this world is about these local, intimate, committed relationships and helping people to grow in Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm after over this next year. If you're somebody here who calls Cornerstone home, I don't want you just to float through things. I don't want you just to show up and be in a service for an hour and a half a week and think somehow this is a sufficient reality in your life. This is a wonderful thing, man. I'm so glad we're getting together and we're gonna sing songs and we're gonna hear from God's word. You're gonna hear scripture read out over you. I'm so thankful we get to hear stories of, of what God is doing from a small cult in, in Tennessee. And I, 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 by the way, you should have never given me that one. That one I'll just have my teeth into for the rest of your life. But that's not it. 
It's about being it in one another's lives. It's about slowing down and caring about what's going on and, and being there to answer questions and dig deep and pray for one another. It's about a church having elders that give oversight to them to help them to become the people that God has intended them to be and, and those within this church to submit in such a way that the world is confounded that we have so much joy in this relationship that we have together. Is it messy? Oh, it's messy. But the mess is what makes it so beautiful as the testimony to the world. And Paul and Peter both say, this is how we're going to do it. These local, intimate committed relationships with one another. But it's not just Peter. It's just not Paul. I think this is the way Jesus was going to do it. Go with me if you got your Bibles to Matthew 28. We're going to kind of swing it in here, looking at just the, at the life of Jesus and how he talked through this. Matthew 28, we all know this is the Great Commission. It's Jesus commissioning his, his followers to be the ones that they're called to be. And that famous statement in verse 18 where Jesus comes amongst them and he just says to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you're going, make disciples of all nations. I'm calling you to the biggest thing ever. I'm calling you to the grandest reality it is a reality that's talked about in, in, in chapter 16 of this church that I'm about ready to build that the gates of hell won't be able to stand against. In fact, as he's talking to those guys, he's sharing with them, this thing is going to be so huge and so powerful, even Satan himself and all of hell and all of Hades will not be able to hold back what my church is going to do. I'm calling you to the greatest thing ever. Now, again, in the back of my head, I, yeah, I would think Jesus would be like, okay, fellas, here's what you're going to do. We're going to go rent out the Colosseum. We've got to get to Rome. We're going to have a big following. We're going to not only that, but we're going to put stuff all over, leaflets all around Rome. And we're going to invite everybody there in the middle of this grand Colosseum. And I'm going to make the greatest announcement of all time because this is who I am as Jesus. I am the great I am. I am, I am the, the lion and the lamb. I'm going to make this announcement. But he doesn't do that. In fact, when you look back at verses 16 and 17, it just talks about 11 of these disciples that come meet him on a hill. Isn't that crazy? The greatest thing ever, and he just invites 11 of his followers just to come meet him on a hill. He'd been pouring his life into them, demonstrating in this intimate, connected, committed way, what does it look like to follow me and how do we love one another and how do we manifest the kingdom? And it's not manifested through these grandiose things. It's manifested in the simple realities of life of loving one another and caring for one another, confronting one another, just being together. And it was out of those 11 people that he said, let's go. Let's go. Now, you know those 11 guys didn't have a clue what was going on. Those 11 guys were like, yeah, sounds good. But I don't know if I believe him because we find out in verse 17, or 17 that some of them didn't even believe it. But what is so amazing on it is in Acts, we find out he promises that my Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And when my Holy Spirit comes upon me, you're going to be witnesses to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. You're going to share who I am. And it's going to happen from this small moment. Now, here's what I want you to think about. The greatest mission ever that was launched from these 11 people that by the time we get to Acts, 1, to Acts 2, we find out that there's 120 people. Within the first day, 5,000 people are added to their number, and they just begin to live together. They lived together in powerful, passionate ways, and, and just let me say this, they didn't have the Bill of Rights, they didn't have all the different things that we have as followers of Jesus in the United States, which I love them, and, and Paul tells us to pray for this peace, but they didn't have it. It was a completely imperfect situation to advance the greatest message ever but they just began to carry out what Jesus said and just make disciples. They got into these local committed relationships to one another with elders and with saints, and, and they just began to carry out what God had called them to do. 
A hundred years after they did it, I was, I was reading this, this scholar kind of working through church history. A hundred years after they started, they had 45,000 people within the church. Spread all throughout the Roman Empire that time and even moving outside of it. Within 50 years, in, in 200, and AD 200, suddenly now, you have about 225,000 people. It just began to take off. Now again, this is also in the midst of some of the most incredible persecution being brought upon the church. But as you read church history, what you find is these committed people that are just loving on one another, caring for one another, and this message just keeps advancing at an alarming rate. Until by the time we get to AD 250, the church has almost 1.2 million people. 1.2 million without Facebook. <laughs> How did they do it? Don you mean the Denver Broncos? Oh, donkeys. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the obvious. How did they do it? They just kept building relationships together. Committed relationships. Let me just say this to everybody that's here. I, I do, I love this church. And so I don't want you to get me wrong at the end of the day what I'm trying to say here. And this is the difficulty of communicating in a way like this. I would much rather have 50 passionate followers of Jesus than 5,000 that are lukewarm. I want to be involved in a church in which we do passionately love one another. We, we commit together in such a way in covenanting of who God is to, to make disciples of, of people so that this thing doesn't just stay and see me. My heart is to continue what Cornerstone has always done. This gospel needs to make it to the nations. But for us, this is our place now. I know so many people think, how in the world can we survive here? We need to move away from here. I understand why. In fact, every time I go to Wyoming, people look at me and they're like, how can you still live out there in California? <laughs> because I believe in the gospel of Jesus. I believe the gospel of Jesus can change hard hearts. I believe something that seems so impossible to advance when a group of people begin to commit to one another and love one another and begin to now out of their lives make themselves about the great one, Jesus Christ. You cannot hold back that group of people. And over this next year and again even over these next weeks, that's what I want to talk about. I believe Cornerstone has not called just to do services on Sunday, to do nice things for people. We're called to join Jesus in the big thing. And that means we need to be in relationships together. Now what I wanna do is I wanna bring up one of our elders, uh, Mike uh, Steinwender, if you don't know him. He's an incredible guy. He and I started spending time together, probably I don't know when it was. When, when did we start to hang out? Too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I forget how old you are. Wait. But, um, <laughs> I love you too. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember when I was thinking to myself, who am I gonna invest my life into? I was looking around at that time and I just found this guy that couldn't get enough of God's word. He was asking questions and wrestling through things and I just looked at him and I said, hey, could we start meeting? And we started hanging out at the bagel shop. I can't think of oh, it. Millie's. Millie's Cafe. Yeah, Millie's Bagel Shop, same thing. Um, <laughs> we're really tight. Um, <laughs> but we just started being together and loving one another, and I saw a man that passionately loves Jesus. And so what I'd love for him to do right now as one of these elders that Peter says that you're called to submit yourselves to if you're gonna be a part of this local church, I don't wanna just say we have elders. My heart each week is to bring up a different elder and let you get to know them, and so I'd like to introduce to you, if you don't know him right now, uh, one of our pastors on staff, but one of our elders that's seeking to bring about this local committed expression of Jesus, uh, Mike Steinwinder. So welcome, Mike. <laughs> right, bright lights. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Um, wow, that's, that's great to be up here. Um, you know, it's interesting, you, you hear about testimonies or life stories, and I'm sure many of you have heard those from various people and people standing up on stage. And I think for me, mine is, um, 
<laughs> he told me not to cry. <laughs> I am a, I'm a man that is so grateful, and I'll correct myself, that, um, you know, Jesus reached down and saved me. And uh, it, my story is really not my story. It's Jesus' story. And I'm just a character in that. And, you know, he, he started his story, and part of that is just his saving grace, right? And then outside of that is Todd's talking about his discipleship is having men invest in you. And uh, at the time, I, you know, I was arrogant and, and prideful. And, uh, but, you know, God was faithful to, in this story, his story, and me being one chapter in that, is he, was, he had selected a couple of faithful men that were followers of him, that understood what it meant to make disciples. And they invested in me. As time went on, I arrogantly would tell them, I'm Catholic, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I don't need that. I already know what's going on. So in that pridefulness and that arrogance, you know, they, this gentleman by the name of um, Kelly uh, continually invested in me, didn't take no for an answer, was very kind, uh, but very purposeful in what he was doing. And so, um, so that's part of that story, the beginning of that story. And it went on and on with other men investing in me as well. But to start that off is, you know, I grew up in Simi Valley. been here since 1965 and, um, you know, raised Catholic. And for my family particularly, and it's not, not to say anything bad about my parents, but they didn't know any better. So Sunday mornings we would get up have breakfast, my mom would dress us, drop us off in the beginning, you know, the front of the church, drive away, and expect that we were going to get something from those individuals, you know, the, the, the priest teaching. And this went on and on and on and on and for many, many years. But inside of our house, there was never the mention of God. The, the Bible we had stood up in the, in the den it was a beautiful white leather-bound Bible, but it was never opened. My mom would dust it off. And so... This went on for years and years and years. So we went to school, I confirm, you know, communion, confirmation, on and on and on. But never understood what the purpose was for that, right? My, uh, I think the only time my father had ever, if I could remember, in church with us was the day Vicky and I got married. Um, so you can see that, you know, lack of leadership, lack of God in the household just uh, led to a selfish man arrogant man and it's part of my life I'm ashamed of <clears throat> but at the end of the day God had sent a man a gentleman by the name of Kelly I uh, went to work for a company in Camarillo and he happened to be a uh, the driver for the president of the company did errands kind of an errand board and that's how I looked at him I got a call by the president that day to say, hey, Mike, you know, you have a new technology group. Would you please invest in this young man? And, you know, we want to get him out of driving cars to a man that uh, can do something for himself and for his family. So I welcomed Kelly in, and there's something odd about him right off the, the first day. Um, didn't curse. Didn't go drink with us at lunch or after work. Um, loved his wife, loved his kids and always read his Bible, always had his Bible on his desk. And so, you know, you get to watch someone do those kind of things. And I remember he would very kindly, you know, ask me about my faith, and I would always arrogantly push him off. I didn't want to have anything to do with it because I thought I had it all under control. Um, so you talk about this discipleship and this investment like Todd was talking about. This gentleman, uh, for about six years, kept investing in me. And for six years, I just kept ignoring him on and on and on. And I remember one time he, uh, you know, he was just kind of, we Vicky and I were probably struggling with something in our marriage. This is, you know, most marriages aren't perfect, but, you know, and I, I started to talk to Kelly and he continually would bring me back to what God said. His word about being a leader in your home, loving your wife like Christ loved the church, being a father to your kids, being a leader, just 
things that just were so foreign to me. Although in deep down inside, I knew that they made sense. I just didn't want to believe it, right? I didn't want anything to do with it. So time goes on, and uh, I moved to another company, get a promotion, and for some reason, I think Kelly's on my heart. And I decided to bring him to this new company with me. And Kelly didn't change at all. When Kelly came to work for me, Kelly was the same man professing the gospel constantly, through life, through application, just, just his actions. So I knew he was a man I could trust. He was a man that uh, um, there's something odd about him. I always thought it was a weakness, but actually it was a strength. And uh, it was pretty interesting later on down in life as we talked through that. But So Kelly came, worked for me, and uh, like I said, Kelly didn't change, but I, I continued to get even more arrogant and more prideful. And for one thing I learned from my father was to work hard and support your family. So that's what's on your mind, right, as a young man, just work, 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 work. So at that time, one of the, my favorite things to do, and, and unfortunately for me, became just my, more important than God, number one, but almost more important than my family because I, all I wanted to do was go work out at the gym. Three hours a day, six days a week, work out, work out, work out. That's all I cared about. And, uh, and with that, you know, and, and not to say weightlifting is bad, but for me it was very bad because it just created even more pridefulness in me. Standing in front of the mirror looking at, oh, look at all the body parts I'm forming and developing, and it just, it was out of control. Um, so still arrogant, disrespectful. I mean, just, uh, it just wasn't a kind person. Most people probably say, is a guy that just doesn't love others. Excuse me. And um, so life goes on, and uh, I get caught up in, you know, a lot of companies, you get caught up in some of the political things that go on at, at work, and I just happened to, at that time, get caught up in a political decision where a guy that worked, I worked for, with in a different department became my boss. And I was target number one for him. And so I remember one day, you know, get called into HR unexpectedly, and I'm going to get terminated um, because he just doesn't want me working for him. And, um, you know, out of my arrogance, I'm thinking, no problem. I'm Mike Steinwinder. I'm, people are always calling me for jobs. I'm top, one of the top technologists in Southern California at this time, and, and uh, I'll get another job. No big deal. So I arrogantly walk out, come home, and call a couple of friends of mine to say, hey, I'm out looking for a job. And right away, within a day, I get this, this uh, phone call to go out, all the way out to Duarte. I don't know if you guys know where Duarte is, but it's like an hour from Simi Valley. And so I go and meet this gentleman, and um, he's the head of the department, and we start talking. And he, this guy's name was Al Tangan, very nice man. Um, and he also, there's something different about him. He's very kind, very polite, just, just all about family and all about working hard, and he never talked about God, but um, there's just something different about him. So I, I show up that morning, and, and this is it's kind of key to, you'll see the steps and what happened to me. Um, so I go in, uh, interview, uh, he loves me, uh, which I expected, right, in my arrogance at that time. Uh, I meet the vice president of the division, he loves me, more arrogance, right? Um, then I go in and meet the president of the company. The president of the company offers me a job right there on the spot. Marches me down to HR. You know, I kindly accept because it's an offer. One of those offers you just can't refuse, right? I accept. I go down to HR, and I'm filling out the paperwork, which for most people, you realize that doesn't really happen, right? You interview, and you do your thing, and then uh, they call you up and say, hey, you have an appointment with HR to fill out your paperwork. And I didn't realize what was going on at that particular time, that here I am filling out paperwork for employment, and I'm going to go home. But God had a plan because that was like the first thing that, um, you know, in, in the scheme of, of the change in my life in which he had to, remember the whole time, I'm this arrogant man that, that knows God, knows Jesus, who Jesus is, but didn't want to accept him. So I'm moving on uh, in, in life and still remaining really arrogant. And the one thing that's so important to me wasn't, wasn't my wife and kids. Again, like I said, it was working out in the gym and I couldn't wait to get home and work out. And uh, so in the, in the scheme of things, God sets, here's point number one. Here's one thing I'm going to set in motion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have him get hired by this company, which is normally uncommon, the, the first day you do your interviews, and then I'm going to deal with Mike in a, in a minute. Matter of fact, a couple of days later, he dealt with me. So he, 
what God was doing was now orchestrating. He, he had already put in my life a man that was going to invest in me. And mind you, not, not one day, one week. This is years that Kelly's investing in me. He puts me in a company after all this turmoil, filed you know, all the employment paperwork. A couple days later, I'm at the gym. And thinking life's great, got a great job, huge increase, almost, I, I don't know if Vicky's here someplace, probably 50% of what I was making before, which is huge in those days. Thinking, man, I got it all done, this is great. So I go to the gym, and uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, like I normally do, heavy day, if you guys know what a heavy day is, means as much weight you can lift as, you know, to, to, to kind of get on, on, on a bulk up day. So I'm sitting down, and I'm lifting weights, and, and uh, I stand up, and I have a pain in my head like someone hits me in the back of the head with a hammer. And uh, dizzy and sick to my stomach and sit down, drink a little bit of water, um, put a towel over my head, and my buddy does his set, and you know, he says, uh, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I think I'm good. And he says, you're up. And I said, no problem. Arrogantly, I, instead of I should have stopped because something wasn't right, I worked out. Matter of fact, I worked out for three more hours. Headache, not feeling good, but I, got, I had to get my workout done. Work out, go home, you know, headache. And, and I, I honestly believe, I don't think I even mentioned anything to Vicky about that headache because Mike's in control. And uh, go home, you know, have a night, good night. We plan on going to the beach um, the next morning. And so I, I'm not going to do all the details of what was happening during the morning, but I bent down to pick up the newspaper and I stand up. And right away, the minute I stand up, I got this pain in the back of my head, um, dizzy. I mean, something was wrong. Vicky's getting ready. And uh, so I go lay down in bed. A couple, I don't know how long I was out for, but um, so I'm awake. I hear Vicky talking to me and, 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 and trying to shake me and you know, I'm kind of coming semi to and stuff and not really know what's going on, but I can hear her talking to the paramedics and I can hear the police there going, oh, this guy's probably, it must be a drug overdose or it must be steroids or something like that, something that's going to cause this to happen to him. And the whole time Vicky's like, no, no, it's, you know, Mike's really healthy and he works out. I mean, he's got amino acids and things and proteins up in the cabinet, but you're not going to find any drugs in the house. So, they, you know, they do their ransacking, going through things. And so... I remember passing out again and uh, wake up in the hospital room, in the emergency room, and uh, Vicky's by my side, and, and she's trying to commun- talk to me. So, and I'm, I can hear clearly everything that my wife's asking me, but could not respond back. Gibberish. So she hands me a piece of paper and a pencil and says, well, could you write your answers down? And of course, yeah, I, sure I can. Scratch. Not making any sense. So we get to the point where we're just you know, nodding, hey, yes, no, yes, no. She's asking me questions. And, uh, you know, I'm starting to regain consciousness again and strength, and I can feel this, my body just kind of changing, right? And so I, uh, I remember uh, I had to go to the bathroom, you know, like, oh, you know, making those signs that I, I've got to go to the bathroom really bad, and they want to stuff a bedpan underneath me, and I'm like, mm, that Mike Steinwinder's not, we're sitting on a bedpan. So I remember getting up and I was able to walk and move around and stuff. And they're just looking at me like, what is going on with this guy? We have no idea. So they run a quick CAT scan, nothing. CAT doesn't see anything. Send me home. And I go home. You know, by then I regained my strength. Not really talking well. Could answer a few questions here and there. But what really caught my attention was my daughter wanted me to read a book, Little Mermaid, to her. <laughs> and so I'm sitting in the chair and, and I'm starting to read it. And I, could probably, I think I got the out. And then the rest of it, Little Mermaid was, I, I don't even know what I said, but my kids are laughing at me, thinking it's hilarious, you know. What's wrong with daddy, you know, kind of thing. And the whole time we're thinking, ah, we don't know what's going on. So I'm going to move real quick through this, the doctor visit, but there's some key, key points in there that, are, that will show you how God was working in, in this time. So uh, remember, I fill out the employment paperwork, which is uncommon, point in time. Have a stroke. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you what happened. I kind of blew the, the thing there. But you probably all figure that's what happened. Um, go to the doctors. You know, the doctors, you know, great blood. You're in great shape. You know, uh, no high blood pressure, on and on and on. We don't know what's going on. We're going to send you a neurologist. So go to the neurologist, and the guy asked me like two or three very simple questions. 
And uh, I couldn't explain what it looked like outside. I, I could not articulate what the day was. And he's like, eh, I think you had a, you had a stroke. I'm like, there's no way I had a stroke. You don't know me. I'm unhealthy and on and on. So I, I would not accept that. So after talking to him, you know, and the, all the doctor visits, and I think that week I, I probably had, I mean, I had been, had so many blood tests. I didn't think I had any blood left, to be honest with you. And um, so the whole time, God's, he's working on this, right? I started thinking through, um, yeah, what, what's going on here? Why, why would... Why would my friend Kelly be telling me about how, you know, God loves me and that, you know, he, he's going to get your attention somehow. So in the back of my mind, I think, oh, maybe this is God trying to get my attention. But still very arrogant, didn't think, um, thought, you know, I'm, I'm in great shape. I'm going I'm to be able to do this myself. I don't really need the doctors to do it. But my loving wife just kept pressing it and pressing it. And so uh, we make an appointment to get an MRI. So, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't fit very well inside those machines in it. So I'm sitting in there, you know, in hours you get the, the thing do, making its noise and stuff. And um, like normal, you don't get the results. The, you talk to the radiologist and he shakes his head like, yeah, yeah, no big deal. Next morning we go to the doctor to uh, uh, find out the results. He says, I got one more test for you to do too. But the reason why I'm going to do that is because your MRI results came back. And he said, it's... Uh, it's just weird. Uh, you did have a stroke. You had an uh, aneurysm. And uh, do you know that 98, at this time, I don't know how the statistics are now, but at that time, he tells me 98% of the people um, die from that, what you had. Uh, if 2% survive, and out of the 2%, most wind up paralyzed, can't speak, have some type of issues that go on. He says, but something's odd with you because... You're standing in front of me, you're talking, you know, not well sometimes, but you're talking, you're articulating, you're, and you're strong. And there, so, so something's not right. He said, but one thing that was very interesting inside of your results is that that blood vessel's healing itself, which we've never seen. <sighs> Miracle number two, right? So he says, man. God must be watching out for you because you do, people don't survive this, but you are. You're a miracle. And you, ever, you better thank your God. I'm thinking, wow, this is just, it blows me away to think that, you know, me? Why would he save me? Go in for the second procedure was an angiogram. Put a camera up your main arteries, look at your heart, you know. Doctor saying, man, this guy's got stainless steel, man. He's got, nope, they thought maybe a piece of plaque had gone up and caused that, but it's like stainless steel. The dude's healthy, nothing's going on him. They go up inside the heart. Of course, he warns me, your heart's gonna go pretty quick with it and, or speed up and not a problem. And he says, we're gonna do one other thing. And we, we read this article where you could twist the head a little differently to get the camera back up underneath the brain or the back side of the brain. And uh, are you okay with that? I'm like, whatever right now, do whatever you think you need to do kind of thing. So he, get the, the doctor goes in there, I don't know what they, what they call that particular field. Um, he goes in there and I'm watching on the screen and the guy's, the guy's up inside of my brain, I can feel the, 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 the heat, right, from the camera. And he says, oh, by the way, um, if you're going to have another stroke, it's going to be right now. So <laughs> be prepared. I'm thinking, all right. <laughs> and um, so um, he goes, man, he calls his, his associate and he goes, look at this, this thing's healing, it's healed. It's like it never happened, right? They see the scar tissue, but he's like, we've never seen this happen before. And, uh, and he's like, dude, um, you know, he leans over and says, dude, man, God's watching you, <laughs> number three or number two, whatever it is. And I'm thinking, man. So the whole time in my head, I'm, 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 I'm hearing doctors tell me, it's a miracle that you're alive. And at the same time, I'm thinking what Kelly's always been telling me, right? And I'm starting to think, man, why? What, what is the purpose? So to add to that particular event, we go home and, and Vicki had been, I see her in the back over there hiding. Um, we go to talk to the doctor, you know, and he tells me one thing that I thought I would never want to hear anyone tell me. Remember how arrogant I was. It's all about me and my weightlifting and my body, right? He tells me, uh, hey, Mike, 
the, the guys at, at UCLA want to cut you open and, and kind of explore and see what, why it did what it did. He said, don't let them do that. He said, go live a long life. He said, but I have something for you you're not going to be able to do. And I'm like, well, what is that? Can't lift weights anymore. And I'm thinking, what? No weights, no scuba diving, no skydiving. Nothing that will change the pressure inside your head, right? And I'm thinking, so the whole time, I'm not thinking about the grace <laughs> I've just been given. I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, arrogant myself, I can't work out again. And it was tough. I have to be honest, it was very tough to stop doing something, but very thankful. And um, the whole time, God's working the first miracle, the thing of the employer. So Vicky's on the phone talking to this employer, and uh, she says, hey, we're sorry, you know, Mike, Mike had a, a major medical issue where he's not going to be able to start. They expected me to be to work that Monday. And uh, the guy, Al's like, hey, no problem. We want Mike so much to join our team. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're actually moving his start date back because now we're going to pay him and we're going to cover his insurance. And we're, I'm like, whoa, you know, what, who does that? Um, total blessing. So you can imagine this time, God's really now, everything I was, Kelly was telling me now is in my mind thinking, wow, what a blessing this is. And does he really love me that much to, to do what he's doing? But in reality, in, to, in reality Kelly's being faithful, a follower. Like we're talking about discipleship. Kelly's being a man that's faithful to make sure that the gospel's being spread, that he's investing in men. And the whole time, I'm, you know, I'm ignoring him, but... This, this is what's happening to, and, 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 and to, to come to this point where I wind up accepting him. A um, week later, I, I start up my job. Blown away that, you know, I can walk, talk, I can function. And uh, very grateful. Um, and I meet the second man real quickly, um, Dell. And Dell's a faithful follower of Christ another believer, another discipler, that right away, you know, the minute I meet him, he starts asking me my story. We t- and I tell him, he's like, whoa, dude, you gotta be kidding me. God has done all this to this point and you still don't believe in him. You still don't trust him. And, uh, and that really caught, caught me. I mean, I'm like, man, I, I think I better pay attention. So I'm reading my Bible. You know, they give me a Bible. I'm reading this Bible with them. They're explaining things, or, or Dell is to me. And, uh, and things are starting to click. You know, this, this Bible comes to truth, right, in, in your life. Starts very quickly within a week or so, I, I find out Kelly's out of work. Remember Kelly, six, seven, eight years ago. I bring Kelly on board. Um, total blessing for him and his family, but now I have two men that had invested in me for so long, now reinvesting in me, making sure, answering questions, just you know, really pouring it on actually a little bit more. How would, you wait, how would you waste this miracle and not move forward? And so, short story, I accept the Lord. Um, and I think for me that that was a transformation that I just, I mean, it was like night and day. You know, you, you're, you're, you're sinful, you turn from your sin and you walk forward, right? And so, um, and that's what I did. My wife will probably tell you night and day, um, from where he was at to where he is today. And so, thankful for that. And over the years, I, I, I matter of fact, Corey Rivera's here. I went to Calvary Chapel. I, I told Vicki, we're going to church. We're going to start Sunday morning. So we, we find Calvary Chapel in Simi Valley. And uh, the Rivera's are there. We get to know them. They actually are shepherding our kids that, excuse me, are there. So, Moving forward, you know, we, in the Bible, understanding everything Kelly was telling me for years, finally accept him, and then realize that uh, as they invested me, God's plan was for me to reinvest in others. And so that's the heart I have as, as a pastor and elder, is that I, I don't think I ever looked back, um, got to know Todd, and started, in, uh, he was investing in me as well, but to, to show you how that and I want to encourage you just and I'll, in just a second, but to show you that progression is that now it's my responsibility to make disciples, right? Disciples make disciples, make disciples, and on and on. So I got a friend of mine that's sitting in the church here. Um, and I invested in him. And I'm thankful that he's a, he's a follower now of Christ. So it's just, it blows me away to see 
And, and the reason why for me it's just so heartfelt is that I look at his life and that was me. I remember my arrogance and my unwillingness to accept Jesus. And, and as I'm sharing with him, he's doing the same thing for me. So I'm like, well, I'm getting it all back now, right? And uh, to, to the one day that he calls me and on a Sunday and says, you know, I, I've been meeting with this little Chinese guy. He's got these big hands. And uh, I'm working out with him at the gym. And he's inviting me to his church. So he goes to his church. And the whole time I'm investing in, in, in this, this gentleman here, Andrew. And uh, it got to one point that he didn't want to hear it anymore like I did. Don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear about this Jesus. Get out of my life. I, I don't want to be a part of you. So one day he kicked me to the curb. Nice guy, right? But I kept pressing in as much as I could to the one day he calls me and says, hey, man, I, um, I accepted Jesus. And I got baptized at Lake Mead, and, and I'm just blown away. So the point I want to make to everybody, and I kind of went way over, I encourage Cornerstone, all of you, don't give up. Invest, invest, invest. Keep staying faithful, because it may not happen at day one, week one, year one, it could be five years down the road that you've invested in, whether that's a man or a woman or a child, keep investing in them. Because at the end of the day, they will. The Lord will grab their heart and they will, you'll be surprised who accepts the Lord. So as an elder here at Cornerstone and a shepherd, man, I love you guys and all the other guys do as well. We want so much, you guys, to be faithful followers of Jesus, to be disciple makers. And that's what you're going to be hearing over the next uh, several weeks is how do we become and how can we be faithful disciple makers. So this is it, my story.